Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for the second lecture in the International CNS Vestibular Disorders course 2020. The title for today's lecture is Ocular Motor Anatomy and Physiology. My name is Alwyn Murphy. I'm a fellow in ocular motor and vestibular neurology at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Thank you to the organizers for Gino for uh, facilitating this great course and in particular to Jose Pinto and Daniel Gold for helping with the coordination. A lot of the clinical videos that you're going to see in today's lecture are taken uh, from Dr. Gold's website. So thank you to him for sharing those and there's a huge amount of treasure trove of information there with great clinical videos illustrating different neuro-ophthalmological and neuro-otological disorders and excellent diagrams. So I'd encourage you to go over there and check it out. Second acknowledgement goes to Dr. Lee and Dr. Z. Much of the content regarding the anatomy and physiology of the uh, ocular motor system in this lecture today is uh, contained in their textbook, The Neurology of Eye Movements, which of course is the seminal textbook in this area. So what I'd like to do today is to give you a good overview of how the ocular motor system works. The ocular motor system is not just important for the neurologist, it's also very useful for the neuro-otologist and vestibular specialist to understand. Getting a good um, knowledge and understanding of how the ocular motor system works in order to move the eyes is really essential for understanding how disorders can affect these pathways. So to do this, I'm going to start peripherally and I'm going to move centrally. I'm going to discuss the unique properties of the extraocular muscles and how this makes them susceptible to certain diseases. Next, I'm going to move on to the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves, which of course provide innervation to the extraocular muscles. We'll review their anatomy and we'll go through some illustrative cases of palsies of these nerves. Finally, we'll move on to the different classes of eye movements, including smooth pursuit, vestibulo-ocular reflex, um, optokinetic nystagmus, saccades, vergence, etc. And we'll um, review the central pathways that control these eye movements and how they can come, become disrupted in certain disorders. So, starting with the muscle. The orbit has some really unique properties which affect how the eyeballs move and how the extraocular muscles must function to counteract these forces. For example, there's viscous drag which uh, provides a resistance to movement when the eyes, eyeballs try to move. Secondly, there are elastic forces which try and drag the eyeballs back into position uh, when they're in an eccentric position. So the extraocular muscles are annotated here with the stars. And these muscles must have rapid, uh, powerful contraction in order to overcome viscous drag. And they must also have a steady sustained contraction to overcome elastic forces. These forces really form the basis of gaze evoked nystagmus. For example, when I move my eyes out to the right, I first have to overcome the viscous drag to reach that position. When I fixate on the eccentric position, the elastic forces then try and drag my eyes back to the center. If my extraocular muscles are not firing steadily and appropriately, this elastic force will win. It'll drag the eyes back towards the midline and I'll be forced to make a refixation saccade to bring, bring them back out to my target position. This forms the basis of gaze evoked nystagmus, which is of course seen in a range of central disorders. The extraocular muscles have some unique properties. They cannot really be considered exactly the same as skeletal limb muscles. This is why there are a long list of muscle disorders which do not affect the eyes. For example, this patient has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is a muscular disorder causing profound muscle weakening, weakness and wasting of most muscles of the body. However, the extraocular muscles are usually spared in this disorder. Why is that? 
Well, the extraocular muscles have certain properties that allow them to contract rapidly and to resist fatigue. Compared to skeletal limb muscles, they have structural differences, including small motor units, high nerve to muscle fiber ratio, and a mix of both singly and multiply innervated fibers. They also have biochemical differences, including a high metabolic rate and different gene expression. These unique properties mean that extraocular mu muscles uh, are not always affected in more global muscle diseases. On the other hand, some of the unique properties of extraocular muscles make them more susceptible for certain diseases. The high energy demand, high metabolic rate, and high mitochondrial content make them susceptible to mitochondrial disease. Patient in this video has chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia as a manifestation of mitochondrial disease. And we're going to see that her range of eye movements is limited in all directions. In addition, multiple classes of eye movements are limited. So she has difficulties with smooth pursuit and saccades, for example. Now she's trying to look to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left. We can see substantial restriction of movement uh, or limitation of motility as manifestation of ophthalmoparesis. Her saccades are also slow, as we can see now in the vertical direction up and down. So this case illustrates well that muscle diseases, which cause weakness of the muscles themselves, will affect all classes of eye movements. The muscle cannot discriminate between whether the signal is for uh, a saccade or a smooth pursuit if it's weak, for example. Moving on to the neuromuscular junction. This is where the motor neuron meets with the muscle fiber at the motor end plate. This relies on a rapid and appropriate um, transmission of particular neurotransmitters to facilitate this innervation. But because the neuromuscular junction is slightly different in the extraocular muscles with a high firing frequency and a slightly different structure, this makes the extraocular muscles susceptible to disorders which affect the neuromuscular junction, the most common of which is myasthenia gravis. So this patient here, as we can see just in the initial clip, has ptosis of both eyes, very common sign of myasthenia gravis. When she's asked to move her eyes, which I'll show you in a moment, you'll see that she has um, weakness of many of her extraocular muscles. So now she's uh, looking centrally, now looking to the right, looking to the left. Her range of movement is limited, limited looking up, a little bit better looking down. And we can see as she's being examined, her eyelids actually start to droop further. This is a, a key clinical sign of myasthenia gravis, this fatigability of the muscles. And now you're going to see when the examiner lifts up one of her eyelids, the other eyelid actually droops even further. This is because the eyelids must receive equal innervation. And so when one is lifted and the motor neuron firing rate is allowed to decrease, then the other eyelid uh, droops if the neuromuscular junction is not working effectively. It's a unique sign in myasthenia gravis called enhanced ptosis. So there are six extraocular muscles that move the right eye and six extraocular muscles that move the left eye. They are the medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior and inferior recti, and superior and inferior oblique muscles. These muscles have to work synergistically so your eyes can move um, in a conjugate way and maintain a steady gaze. For example, for my eyes to move to the right, I have to uh, contract my right lateral rectus and my left medial rectus at the same time. And double vision occurs when the eye movements are not conjugate and when there's not um, a careful coordinated contraction of the right and the left eye. Some patients will actually describe uh, double vision as causing dizziness. So they may end up at a neurotology or vestibular clinic. This type of patient will describe that the dizziness caused by double vision improves when they cover one of their eyes. So now I'm gonna take you through each of the three cranial nerves that innervates the extra, extra ocular muscles. 
the three nerves, uh, the third, the fourth, and the sixth nerve, exit the skull through the cavernous sinus. The first of these uh, that we'll discuss is the sixth nerve. This nerve controls and innervates the lateral rectus muscle in each eye. For example, when I look to the right, I activate my right lateral neck rectus muscle. The nucleus for the abducens of the nerve is in the uh, pons and it exits at, at this level. This is what the sixth nerve looks like on a skull base MRI in axial segment. This small structure exiting the brainstem ventrally. It's in quite close proximity to the eighth nerves. So this is clinically important. Uh, some disorders that cause multiple cranial neuropathies in this region, such as neurosarcoidosis, can manifest with problems of both the sixth and the eighth nerves. Now I'm going to show you an example of um, a palsy of the sixth nerve caused by microvascular injury to the vasa nervorum, the tiny vessel which travels in the center of the nerve. As we can see in this patient who has a right sixth nerve palsy, his right eye is deviated towards the midline in primary position. Look at this here compared to the left eye. And when I show you the video, you'll see that as he tries to look up, it's normal. As he tries to look down, it's also normal. Looking to the left is normal, but as he tries to look to the right, his right eye moves slowly and it can't pass the midline due to weakness of this lateral rectus muscle. So now I want you to watch the, cica the cicades that this man makes. Defocus your eyes on the bridge of the nose and you'll see that the right eye is moving slowly from the, mid, from the left gaze to the midline. Again, moves slowly. Look, moves slowly. So this um, uh, difference between the, uh, the uh, abducting saccade in the right and the left eye is characteristic of a sixth nerve palsy. For the vestibular specialist, it's important to remember that any um, weakness of the right um, lateral rectus muscle may impact video oculography recordings, since uh, many monocular uh, goggles are positioned over the right eye. This can make interpreting uh, the recordings difficult. So the nucleus of the sixth nerve is essential for moving the eyes horizontally. When I look to the right, my right lateral rectus muscle has to contract, but my left medial rectus has to contract at the same time to uh, give me a steady gaze. So what my sixth nerve nucleus does is it sends some, mus some fibers, nerve, nerve fibers across the midline into the medial longitudinal fasciculus up to the nucleus of the third nerve on the other side, which sends out the signal to the left medial rectus ensuring a conjugate gaze to the right side. Because the sixth nerve nucleus provides this trigger for the horizontal gaze, if the nucleus itself is damaged, you're going to have difficulty moving both eyes in that direction. And this is illustrated in this video. This patient had a stroke in the left pons and it manifested with um, oscillopsia and dizziness as well as uh, facial nerve palsy. So uh, presumably this patient had involvement of the vertical semicircular canal pathways passing up through the pons. And as we see in the video, this shows um, uh, upbeat torsional nystagmus towards the right ear. We can also see that this patient has a left horizontal gaze palsy. So when he's trying to look to the left, as he will in a moment, his eyes can't cross the midline. This is because he has a lesion in the left sixth nerve nucleus. So he has lost the ability to trigger horizontal gaze in that direction. And this gives us the important clinical takeaway point that a nerve or fascicle lesion of the, um, of the sixth nerve will cause monocular weakness of the, left, uh, of the lateral rectus, whereas a nuclear lesion of the sixth nerve nucleus will cause ipsilateral horizontal gaze palsy affecting both eyes in that direction. 
So next we're going to move on to the trochlear nerve, uh, the fourth nerve. So this innervates the superior oblique muscle, which is indicated with the stars here. Um, the, the nucleus for the fourth nerve is in the midbrain, and that's the level at which the trochlear nerve exits. The uh, weakness of the superior oblique tends to be quite clinically subtle. What patients will often complain of is uh, double vision in certain directions. For example, when looking down, and particularly when looking down and medially with the affected eye. On examination of the fundus, um, one can see in a fourth nerve, is, nerve palsy that the, right, uh, that the affected eye will be ex-cyclotorsic uh, ex because of loss of the, um, the, the tonic contraction of this in the superior oblique muscle. This is of course important to the vestibular specialist because another differential uh, diagnosis of hypertropia is a skew deviation. So what's important for clinically differentiating the hypertropia of a skew de deviation from a fourth nerve palsy is that with a fourth nerve palsy, a hypertropia tends to differ in different gaze directions and will be most apparent when looking down and medially with the affected eye as compared to the hypertropia of a skew deviation, which tends, which tends to be more competent. So this video now is going to show a patient who has a hypertropia due to a right fourth nerve palsy. You're going to see that in primary position, he's got a slight hypertropia um, on the right side. This becomes exacerbated when he tilts his head towards the right, uh, which is where the superior oblique muscle would usually uh, come into more activity. On the opposite side, when he tilts his head to the left, the hypertropia improves. So here he is in primary position. We can see a small refixation to uh, saccade down, up, down, up. And then when he tilts his head to the right, there's a larger refixation movement. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Then when he tilts his head to the left, there's re uh, really barely uh, visible any refixation movement. So the clinical takeaway point here is that a tilt away from the side of a fourth uh, nerve lesion will improve the hypertropia and double vision, whereas a tilt towards the side of the lesion will worsen it. Moving on to the third nerve. This is the oculomotor nerve, and it's really the powerhouse of the extra, uh, of the nerves that innervate the extraocular muscles. That's because it innervates uh, four muscles on each side, the medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. In addition, it also carries the parasympathetic fibers that innervate the sphincter pupillae and ciliary muscles, which act to con constrict the pupil. Finally, it also uh, provides innervation to levator palpebrae superioris, which of course is responsible for elevation of the eyelids. The nucleus for the third nerve is in the midbrain. So a complete third nerve palsy typically manifests with ptosis due to the levator palpebrae superioris involvement, mydriasis due to loss of the parasympathetic fibres, and the eye pointing down and out because the only muscles that are left functioning are the lateral rectus and superior oblique muscles. So this is an example now of a patient with a vasculopathic third nerve palsy. The interesting point with the oculomotor nerve is that because the vas innervorum travels in the middle and the parasympathetic fibers are really situated at the outermost portion of the nerve here and receive some blood supply from the peel vessels. If there's ischemia of this inner vessel, like in a vasculopathic injury, it tends to spare these outer pupillomotor fibers. So this patient has complete ptosis of the left eye and she has got a, a quite restricted range of motion of the left eye consistent with a third nerve palsy. What we're going to see now is that uh, this uh, restricted range of mo motion spares the in cyclotorsion movement. So if you look at a conjunctival blood vessel, you'll see that uh, the, the eye can in cyclotors appropriately. This shows us that superior oblique muscle is functioning in her case. 
Um, so the clinical point to remember here is that a microvascular third nerve palsy is typically pupil sparing, although some of the pupillary fibers can be involved in about 20% of cases, as we can actually see in this video. On the other hand, a compressive or infiltrative lesion, which tends to move from the outside in, will clearly be pupil involving. Now we're going to move on to central control of the eye movements. The eye movements can be divided into different classes, uh, depending on the purpose of the movement and the neural control. So vestibular uh, uh, system or the vestibulo-ocular reflex is what allows us to fixate on a target while we're in motion, like when we're running. Visual fixation allows our, us to keep our fovea steady so we can crisply see an object in our vision. And then saccades allow us to rapidly move our vision around uh, points of interest so we can understand our environment and keep things on our fovea. Optokinetic nystagmus or optokinetic response allows us to process a moving visual scene while smooth pursuit allows us to fix on a target that's moving in our environment. Finally, vergence allows us to adapt the position of the eyes so that we can see targets at close range, but also see targets at distant points. All of these classes of eye movements um, really are designed to allow us to see clearly in whatever circumstances we may require in normal daily life. And the control of these classes is divided between the vestibular system, the brainstem, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia and the cerebral hemispheres. We're going to start with the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is what uh, gives us such great football players as Manuel Neuer and Lionel Messi. This allows us um, to keep uh, our eyes fixed on a point like a football while we're in rapid motion or twisting and turning. Uh, so Dr. Hash has already given a really great overview of the vestibular system in last month's lecture, which is available on YouTube. So um, I'm not going to cover it in too much detail here. What I will mention is that we have two systems, the first of which is the semicircular canal pathways. These uh, pathways are adapted to, um, to provide responses to angular acceleration. For example, if I'm looking at a target and I pitch my head back into the right, my posterior canal activates, sends signals through my brainstem and to the appropriate um, cranial nerve nuclei in order to get uh, the extraocular muscles to respond and keep my eyes fixed on a target. The second type of pathway is the otolith pathways, and these tend to deal with linear acceleration. So the saccule is more responsible for vertical linear set acceleration, uh, sensing this and adapting eye alignment to it. For example, the sensation of moving up and down in an elevator. Whereas the utricle is adapted to sensing and aligning the eyes uh, when we are in horizontal motion. For example, when we're the passenger in a car. Next, I'll move on to smooth pursuit. So the smooth pursuit system is designed in order for us to keep an object on the fovea. It has good predictive properties so that if something moves, we're able to track it and guess where it's going to go next. The trick with smooth pursuit is that because it's designed to allow us to foveate on a target, the visual system really has to ignore the rest of what's going on in the retina during this movement. There's an overlap, of course, with visual fixation. So it applies in two circumstances. The first is when we're a stationary subject viewing a moving object, like standing on a street and watching a car pass by. The second scenario is when we're a, a moving subject watching a stationary object. For example, if I walk down a forest path and I pick a tree to focus on, I can keep that tree in my, uh, in my focus while I move along. Smooth pursuit is under careful neural to control to allow this sort of closely calibrated system. When an image falls on the retina, it provides a signal to the occipital cortex, which in turn activates various cortical networks in the uh, cerebral hemispheres. The signals are carried through the pons, through the vestibular nuclei and cerebellum, which act to calibrate and really carefully align this, um, this uh, response. It ends with um, activation of the uh, appropriate 
ocular uh, motor nuclei and neurons. This, of course, leads to accurate eye movement, and then the cycle continues. So there's a number of abnormalities that can happen with smooth pursuit. Uh, particularly common is choppy pursuit, and this can occur due to abnormalities of the cerebral networks, for example, or of the cerebellar networks. The first patient here is a 20-year-old man with a history of a left MCA stroke. He has normal pursuit to the right, but when he moves to the left, the pursuit is noticeably choppy. Again, normal to the right. When he moves to the left, it's noticeably choppy. Moving to the right is normal. To the left, he's got this saccadic type choppy pursuit. Then we have this second patient who has a cerebellar disorder and her uh, the pursuit is choppy in both directions. Choppy to the left, choppy to the right, choppy to the left and choppy to the right, which is characteristic of many cerebellar disorders. This of course is relevant to the vestibular specialist because these kinds of patients can turn up at any sort of dizzy or balanced clinic and recognizing these signs in the eye can be important for um, identifying the cerebellum as uh, the source of the disorder. Next movement will, or next class of eye movement we'll talk about is fixation. So what I want you to do is fix your eyes on the cross in the middle of the screen here. You're going to have to come in quite close so that the image is taking up most of your visual field. You'll see that as you focus on the cross for a few seconds, the pink dots in, the, in your peripheral vision will start to fade. However, you'll still be able to see the green, green moving dot. The reason the pink dots fade is that they are stationary. And when we fixate our fovea on an object, stationary objects in our per peripheral vision start to fade in a process of sensory adaptation. So what our eyes do to counteract this is make small, tiny, really unnoticeable fixational eye movements that uh, prevent too much visual fading. The take home point is that our eyes need to be steady in fixation, but not too steady. A number of abnormalities of fixation can occur and are very commonly seen in our clinical practice. The first is nystagmus. This occurs when um, a subject is trying to fix on a target, but the slow phase is drifting away from that target. Um, there's a corrective motion which brings the line of sight back onto the target. And the, um, the nystagmus is named according to that kind of corrective motion. In the case of jerk nystagmus with a saccadic correction, the, um, the slow phased velocity determines the type of nystagmus. Of course, nystagmus can cause oscillopsia. So even if a patient has nystagmus, for example, due to a cerebellar disorder, they may complain of oscillopsia and end up at a vestibular specialist or a neuro otologist clinic. The second type of abnormality of fixation are saccadic intrusions. A couple of these are normal. For example, uh, most of us have some small square wave jerks, which prevents visual fading, as we discussed. It becomes a problem when these, um, the, the saccadic intrusions are too frequent and too large. These uh, can cause macrosaccadic oscillations, opsoclonus and flutter, causing oscillopsia experienced by the patient. So these are examples of patients with pathological square wave jerks. So this first patient has Friedrich's ataxia. She has a cerebellar disorder and we can see here that she's got uh, very much excessive square wave jerks, moving her eyes back and forth, back and forth in little saccadic movements. Uh, the second patient here has a problem in the basal ganglia. She has progressive supranuclear palsy and her square wave jerks, while excessive, um, are not so um, dramatic as the first patient's. Uh, but this is a useful sign in patients with basal ganglia disorders. Now, coming to eccentric gaze holding, this is even more complex than visual fixation and central position. This is because when we move our eyes to an eccentric position, we need to counteract the elastic forces of the orbit. Uh, to do this, we have to have sustained ocular motor neuron uh, discharge rate and steady extraocular muscle contraction. 
again, when I look to the right, I activate my right lateral rectus, my left medial rectus. Steady contraction gives me a clear eccentric gaze. When this um, contraction is not steady, for example, when the elastic forces start to win, then my eyes get dragged back to the center. I have to refixate out with a saccade, and this causes gaze evoked nystagmus. So in a normal uh, healthy person, this uh, system is carefully calibrated and controlled by the neural integrator. The neural integrator is really just a network of important structure, uh, structures, including in the brainstem and the cerebellum. For horizontal gaze, the key structures include the nucleus prepositus hypoglossi and the medial vestibular nucleus. For a vertical and torsional gaze, the key structure is the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. In the cerebellum, the key area for um, the neural integrator is the flocculus and paraflocculus. So this is an example of what I was talking about. When this neural integrator is not working well, um, in this patient, when he tries to bring his eyes out to the side, they get dragged back to the center due by the elastic forces. They need to saccade back out to the side, causing gaze of oak nystagmus. As we can see here, he's got gaze of oak nystagmus, left beating to the left, right beating to the right. This is, of course, direction changing nystagmus. Up beating and up gaze. And when he looks down, you'll see down beating nystagmus and down gaze. He's going to come back to the middle now. And as he looks out to the right, he's got right beating. When he comes back to the midline, look for the left beating nystagmus. It's going to now a few beats of left beating nystagmus. This rebound with um, coming from eccentric position to the midline is characteristic of uh, gaze evoked nystagmus. It helps to differentiate it from endpoint nystagmus, which can be physiological. A few beats often happen when people are last asked to fixate in far as horizontal gaze. So the way to differentiate gaze evoked nystagmus is it has a larger amplitude, it doesn't fatigue, it's present um, around 30 degrees, as well as in far horizontal gaze, and rebound nystagmus is evident in many patients. Moving on to saccades. So saccades can be described in terms of their latency, their conjugacy, their velocity, uh, their trajectory, and their accuracy. This is probably my favorite class of eye movements. It's highly calibrated and highly effective at, effective at its function, which is to bring targets of interest onto the fovea. So I'm just demonstrating some normal saccades here to the right and to the left um, and upwards and downwards. Um, the eyes are conjugate, they're moving rapidly and they're accurately reaching their target. The important point about saccades is that they're really too rapid to be influenced by visual feedback. This means that the, uh, the programming for the saccade has to be completely accurate at the outset for the movement to be um, uh, able to appropriately reach its target. This requires close neural control. This is a complex um, neural pathways involved in this, but the key is that the cortex sends down signals through the basal ganglia, superior colliculus, and through the cerebellum eventually. These uh, signals uh, cascade down into the brainstem where the um, relevant ocular motor nuclei are triggered and a saccade occurs. So there are a couple of key um, locations in the brainstem where the final command for the saccade is generated. The burst neurons, which cause an ex excitatory saccade, differ in terms of location for horizontal movements versus vertical and torsional movements. For horizontal movements, the key uh, anatomical location for these uh, burst neurons is in the pons, in the, uh, the, the PPRF. On the other hand, for vertical and torsional saccades, the key anatomical location is in the midbrain, in the RIMLF, the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. So this is why you can have a saccadic palsy that involves the horizontal uh, saccades and spares the vertical saccades, or vice versa. 
So this first patient here had a history of cancer and radiation involving the brainstem structures. So we're going to see here that he has a good rightward saccade. That's pretty normal. He has a mild six nerve palsy, so it's not quite conjugate. But looking to the left, he has very slow saccade. So right is quick, although not completely aligned. Left is very slow. Quick, slow. Quick, back to the midline. And then if we look in slow motion, you'll see as he looks to the left, well, sorry, as he looks to the right, there's incomplete alignment. And as he looks to the left, the saccade is slow. However, when he's asked to perform VOR, we can see that the eye movement to the left is much quicker. This shows us that the problem is supranuclear and localizes the issue to the PPORF in the pons. So the excitatory burst neurons which trigger the saccade are at fault on the left side. This second patient um, has difficulty with his vertical saccades. So we can see here he's trying to make upward saccades. He's sort of having this zigzag motion as he tries to get his eyes up. Uh, he does manage to get them up very slowly. And then when he's asked to look downward, his saccade is really slow and doesn't really pass the, uh, the middle line. This patient had normal horizontal saccades. And we're going to see now that his saccadic system is the only system at fault. He's able to um, make this upward saccade very slowly. Now, he's able to make the vertical saccade, or sorry, the vertical movement with smooth pursuit. So in this part of the video, he's bringing his thumb up like this and following it with his eyes. Then he's bringing it all the way down and following it with his eyes again. So we can see that his eyes can get up and down with smooth pursuit, just not with saccades. This tells us that the problem is really limited to the excitatory signals for saccades, which of course come for the aura I MLF for the vertical saccades. Now, what is of course important to understand about saccades is that we need them when they're appropriate, but too much saccades is gonna cause problems. That's why we have a constant break on them coming from the omnipause neurons in the nucleus rapha interpositus. These neurons are uh, sort of tonically firing to prevent saccades from happening. When a, a saccade does need to occur, this break is temporarily removed. Saccade occurs, we refixate, and the, the break goes back on. When this system uh, is an error, when we have a loss of these constant breaking omnipause neurons, we get opsoclonus which is basically back-to-back -back saccades in horizontal, vertical, torsional, all directions. This is quite disorientating for a patient and results in oscillopsia. It can frequently um, lead to referral to various specialists, including neurotologists and vestibular specialists. So recognizing that the oscillopsia here is due to these uh, large uh, saccadic uh, uh, intrusions is really important. Now onto the optokinetic system. So optokinetic nystagmus is really our response to a moving visual field. It overlaps very much with smooth pursuit and saccades, although the cortical control is probably slightly different. As we can see here, I'm performing a OKN to a, to a virtual stimulus. I'm close into the screen because with a, an optokinetic stimulus, it really has to occupy most of your visual field. And we'll see here that the slow phases are really smooth pursuit movements. Looking slow phase up, saccade down. In this case, slow phase up, saccade down. Um, so there's input from the visual and vestibular pathways with these kind of responses. This is important uh, to understand how these movements are generated because when we lose the fast phases of these movements, uh, as in the saccades, this can cause great difficulty processing uh, an optokinetic stimulus. This patient here had a recent ischemic injury to the saccadic circuitry in her brainstem, making it difficult to perform saccades. So 
she described that when she was moving along in the car, as we'll see here, when she picked, looked out the window, her eyes moved to the right. The smooth part, the smooth pursuit part of the optokinetic response was accurate, but then her eyes get stuck there and she can't bring them back to, uh, to refixate. We'll watch again. She looks out the window, eyes move to the right appropriately, but then she cannot perfor uh, perform the fast phase of the optokinetic response and refix refixate her eyes. Finally, we'll review virgins. So this is the class of eye movements that allows our eyes to adapt to near uh, targets and to far targets. Um, it relies on sensory fusion and it, the system works really to position our visual axes so that we have binocular singular vision, whether we're looking at something close and our eyes need to come together, or whether we're looking at something further away and our eyes need to diverge a little bit. So as we can see here, when I look um, at my thumb as it's moving towards my eyes, both of my medial rectus muscles need to contract um, together, allowing my eyes to come in like this. So there's a number of abnormalities that can occur with uh, virgin's eye movements. The most common and probably most important uh, for uh, vestibular balance neurotology specialists is convergence insufficiency and divergence insufficiency. Um, convergence insufficiency is where the patient's eyes cannot align and adapt uh, properly to near vision. So usually the eyes would need to come inwards when looking at a near target. Um, it makes sense that it, the patient will report that they have more difficulty looking at close targets if the problem is convergence insufficiency. Typical thing is a patient says they find it difficult to read. The second type of abnormality is divergence insufficiency. This is where the patient's eyes are not good at adapting to far, further targets and diverging appropriately. And again, as you would expect, patients tend to complain that this problem causes double vision, which is worse with distance vision. So they're okay when they're reading, but when they look out the window to try and see a street sign, things are not clear or they're double vision. This patient has divergence insufficiency. So first she's fixing on a near target. And we can see with the alternate cover test, there's no realignment uh, when each eye is uncovered. So her eyes are steady, they're not moving. We do see now she switches to a distant target. The right eye comes out, left eye comes out. Right eye comes out, left eye comes out. Right eye comes out, left eye comes out. Right eye comes out left eye comes out. So this shows that she cannot diverge her eyes appropriately to a distant target. And when the eyes covered, it has a tendency to drift inward. This is why it's called an esotropia. This patient had cerebellar ataxia. So she presented with impaired balance um, and double vision, worse with distance vision. And this is a key uh, um, a common clinical presentation of a patient with a cerebellar ataxia. So I'm just going to finish now by uh, reviewing what we've discussed in this lecture. I want to give you a, a, an overview of how the extraocular uh, muscles work and how they uh, move in a coordinated manner in order to give us clear eye movements. Um, we started peripherally. We discussed the unique properties of the extraocular muscles and what makes them susceptible to certain um, types of diseases. The important take home point in terms of muscle diseases is that these disorders affect all classes of eye movements from saccades to smooth pursuit to virgins. Next we moved on to the third, fourth and sixth nerves which innervate the extraocular muscles. We reviewed various cranial nerve palsies that can cause abnormalities um, with with these muscles and typically manifest with misalignment of the eyes and double vision. Uh, we also reviewed the important take home point that disorders affecting these nerves tend to cause problems with eye movements in certain directions rather than in all directions. Finally, we moved on to the control of the different classes of eye movements. And we reviewed all of these from, um, from virgins, saccades, smooth pursuit, etc. 
it was important to note as well that disorders that affect these classes of eye movements tend to pick off certain classes, for example, smooth pursuit or saccades, rather than involving all the classes equally. So I hope that was useful and thank you again for the opportunity to give this lecture today. Thank you for the organizers and I'm happy now to take any questions that you may have.